many people in Sunday school every Sunday. I wouldn't mind that a bit. Riley, you can come back anytime you want to, too, because if you, if it, you know, you showed up and all of a sudden my Sunday school class almost didn't have enough chairs. Thank you very much, okay? <laughs> we did good, didn't we? We got through it. Did you, did you feel like when you got done, <laughs> I got done? No. No? Okay, good. Facebook doesn't really exist with me, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good having everybody here, and I really, I really, I mean that for all of us. We, we, we have fun. We, don't, we believe that church can be uh, reverence, a lot of reverence in church, and still have fun at the same time. I, it's just kind of the way we kind of the way we roll so it's really good I have to I have to brag on your grandma though is because when I was your age maybe a little bit younger uh, we went to Portales and I guess you guys were having BSU and I got to hear her play the piano I, I'd, I'd grown up here and I got to hear her play in the piano in that in that light and it gave me a lot of joy in my life knowing that hey there's somebody from my school that can play the piano and praise the lord and everything so see there how this whole circle still goes okay i'm 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 one of them too i'm one of them that that grew up uh in this church too i just didn't grow up in the church but i grew up around it okay Anyway, I'll get off of that. We've been talk, talking through, if you want to go to your notes and look at them, um, we're going to be, even though I've got Ephesians 4.32 for us to read, and even though it's in Matthew, uh, basically the line that I'm, want, that I'm driving at here is forgiveness, okay? Because what we've been talking about is we've, uh, I, I started a, a series of sermons called The, Th the Choices That We Make. And, um, and the, the first one was just on choose, to, to choose now to, to uh, set yourself into a position where you are going to hear the gospel, where you are going to hear God talk to you, that you're going to get in your Bible, these kind of things. But then, but then from there, I, uh, uh, we moved into the idea of, uh, because I had mentioned it in that first sermon, the, the prodigal son. And a lot of people, I think every, everybody pretty much in here has heard the, the story or read the story of the prodigal son. And, uh, and, and I, I, all of a sudden it struck me, I had mentioned that in Luke. You, you said you was studied through Luke uh, in there. But, the, but in the prodigal son, I, as, I, as I meant in that first sermon, as I just mentioned it, and all of a sudden it struck me, oh, there's three choices right there. Probably a whole lot more that we could find if I dug deeper into it. And so last week we talked about the, the choice of the son himself, the prodigal son himself, choosing to, uh, to, to go against his father's wishes, choosing to rebel, if you will, and how that, that what that led to uh, his life to, that as he uh, was in the in the, what he thought was going to be a grand time uh, enjoying himself, he ended up in the worst situation he could possibly think to be in, and how he chose to be there because of his rebellion, and so we we get a glimpse of ourselves in our sin. How we, to, when we sin, we choose to rebel against God's uh, best for us, and we say, "No, I think I know what's best for me," and we make a lot of bad choices. Today is when he turns and comes home. He comes and tur turns to come home, and he sees the father running down the road to him. That's my in my. If the Bible doesn't say he was running. In my mind, I see the father running to meet him as he gets close to home there. So, uh, so my, the, today's is on the choice to forgive. This is the Father. This is focusing on the Father. And so I want to read Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Again, a long reading. Uh, yes, I know that, because I, be, but I think it's very, very important on forgiveness. And Peter came up and said to him, obviously the Lord, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, 
I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times. And I'm going to go ahead and 77 times. I'm going to go ahead and look to the King James in this. 70 times seven is what the, is what the word of God says there. Therefore, the, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle, one was brought to him who own, owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, in your own mind, change that in your own mind to several million dollars, okay? And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and the payment to be made. So the servant fell down on his knees imploring him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. Well, he couldn't have. There's no way. This guy didn't have that kind of income and that's the main story more than he could pay, okay? And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found that one of his fellow servants who owed him ten th- uh, uh, 100 denarii, that's by the way, about uh, uh, like uh, uh, in today's, we might say 100 days wages, okay? 100 days wages. And seized him, And he began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to the master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of God's word. We thank you for the fact that this is not somebody's opinion. This is not just me talking up here. This is not a, 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 just a, a fun story, but rather this is the word of God that you, God, have told us that we need to uh, be a paying attention, not only to the fact that we have forgiveness that is offered us when we need it, but Father, also that we might need to forgive others in our time of need, that we might be able to be forgiven by you. And so we ask, Lord, that you teach us from your word, that the Holy Spirit of God would reach in and grab us and work in our lives so that we might be able to hear, not with our ears, but we hear with our hearts what the Lord is saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So... The prodigal son, he comes to the point where he's sick of what his his life has led him to. He is absolutely in the bottom. If you haven't read this story completely, you need to read it yourself. I'm going to read just a portion of it, but you need to read it for yourself to get the whole story. Because this guy had gone to his father, this is last week we saw, gone to his father before his father died. He had actually gone to him and demanded his Um, his part of the inheritance. Well, a few things that we noted. Number one, this is a culture where you don't do that. The father gives to who he wants to. Usually he gives to the older son, and this is the younger son. And so number one, he didn't have anything coming that way. Number two, if the father didn't say specifically so, that he didn't get anything. So what did he have coming? Nothing. What was really his? Nothing. It was his father's. What did he deserve? Nothing. He was the younger son without any, anything. He hadn't made anything for himself yet. So when you go to tying these things together, you see that this guy's really uh, arrogant in the way he, that he comes before the father. Now, in our story, you have to understand the story that Jesus tells. The father represents God, and the younger son is us. And maybe next week we'll find out that it might be one of us as the elder son who wouldn't forgive, okay? So as we get to looking at this story, 
And the portion I'm going to read is concerning the father. Uh, and I, I, I title this portion of it, Get Up and Go Home. That's exactly what he felt in his heart. This is stupid. I'm in a hog pen, a Jewish boy in a hog pen, feeding the pigs slop and wanting to eat with them because I'm so hungry. And how stupid is this? And he says in Luke 15, 18 through 24, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the father said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, his, his, his memorized speech. You see it? Okay. And, and, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice what the father does. He doesn't listen. He interrupts him in the middle of what he was saying. And, he sa and the father says, but the father said to his servants, be quick, run, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. This story is so fantastic for us as Christians to see how the father reacts to us when we turn and go back to the Father when we know we're wrong, when, we, when, when our choices take us into the depths of who we have, uh, we're, the worst thing that could happen to us, there's always a chance to go home. There's always a chance to get up and go home. And so as we look at this, you know, the, the Father, the picture of that Father running down the road to meet Him is probably one of the most touching things in the scripture. God knows you. God knew your name before the foundation of the world. God touched on to who you were going to be and created you anyway. You do get that, don't you? God knew who you were going to be. He knew how your personality was going to be. He knew how your actions were going to be. And what did he do? He made you anyway. And not only does the Bible say that he made you, it says he knit you together in your mother's womb. We have a little one back there being knit together right now in that, and it's absolutely exactly like he's supposed to be. By the way, you see the one sitting on the end of the, end of the pew? He came early. Huh? What? One, one pound, what? Barely got in this world. Okay, he was knit together in his mother's womb just as God wanted him to. What's my point? My point is, is that each of us are different. We don't come out like cookie cutters. We come out being who you are and God loved you anyway and God made you anyway and God knew who you was going to be like and what he does in this is he makes you into a position to where you have to respond to him. It's you in this story getting up out of the pig pen and looking around and saying, this is stupid. My father doesn't treat his servants this way at all. My father takes care of his servants. I tell you what I'll do. I'll go back to him and I'll say, I don't deserve to be your son. I've messed up bad and I don't deserve anything. Just let me be a servant and work for you in the position of a hired servant. Hmm. What the father chose, however, whose God rep is re represented in this story, is God chooses grace. You get that? The, the kid didn't deserve it. I don't know how old the man was. He's still a kid. He didn't deserve it. People ask me all the time, how are you, how are you doing today? And I tell him, better than I deserve. Because I know what I deserve and what I deserved was hell. And God did not make me pay it. Jesus paid it for me. But the Father chooses grace. And the definition of grace is the merciful, loving kindness and goodwill. So the father in this story is 
full of mercy, full of grace, full of, of goodwill toward his son, even though his son had messed up so bad. The father had always loved his son. He's always taken him in his mind. You, you can imagine every night he went to bed, this man was thinking of his son. Where is he at? What's he doing? He wasn't worried about the money. For Pete's sake, people, get your mind out of the, the idea of money and riches and things. He was worried about his son. He loved his son. John 3.16 says that God was that way. For God so loved the world. That's us before we came to know Christ. God loved you then so much that Jesus went to the cross for you because there was only one way you could come back to the Father and that's if God paid for it through His own Son's death. You see, because you deserved to die and go to hell. God said, I don't want that. I will send Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, God Himself. If you want to think of this correctly, God, Jehovah God Himself, got off the throne and went to the cross and paid your debt for you. And all you had to do is say yes. All you had to do is say, I want that in my life. God loves you. He has loved you before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.4 proves that. Even before the world was made, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. See, God chose you to be saved, but He left it up to you to make that choice. You could have done it when you were five, you could have done it when you were 10. You could have done it when you were 19. You could have done it when you were 60. It is up to you to choose Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now you say, well, couldn't God save me anyway? What would be the point? God did not make you an automaton. God did not make you to be somebody that he could poke a button and you would respond the way he wanted you to respond. He wants you to respond yes to that. That father went to bed every night, got up every morning wanting that son to come home. He always has. He always will. He mourned the loss of his son. He mourned the loss of the fellowship of his son. And what it tells me is that ever since the 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 the, the Adam and Eve sinned against God in Eden and rebelled against his word when he said, don't eat of the tree. And they listened to Satan rather than listening to God. And they ate of the tree and said, it's no, no big deal. God's not going to care. And God said, I told you, if you ate of that fruit, you would die. And so he honors their choices. But you know what? He never quit feeling mercy toward man's relationship with him being lost in that moment. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke fellowship with God. God has always looked down the road looking for you to come home ever since then. You say, well, I had nothing to do with Adam and Eve. No, but the, my Bible says that because of Adam's sin, sin uh, death came into the world. And so death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned. My Bible tells me that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, you've got a sin problem. You don't have a, you don't have a character problem. You have a sin problem. And I have a sin problem. The difference that we, we look at is you and I have come to know Christ as our Savior and that sin is gone. It's been washed away. It's no longer there. But that father had never quit feeling mercy for him, wanting and longing for him to be back. Second Chronicles 6.14 says, And the Lord said, Oh, and, and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven and on earth keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. God loves you and he has never broke that out. The, the thought that to, 
that I want you to take home with this is no matter what you've done, God is really ready and he's ready to respond to our repentance in love. Just like that father was looking down the road waiting for him. The father chooses to show in this case, let's look at it, he showed grace in that he was always looking for him. He didn't, kid didn't deserve it. That's the main thing. God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, that's what grace says. However, it is basically God's loving kindness toward us when there's no way we deserved any of it. But he also chose to mercy. He responds in mercy. Definition of mercy is kindness and goodwill toward the miserable and the afflicted. The, 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 the son is rehearsing his speech as he, as he gets up out of the pig pen. He's rehearsing his speech as he goes down the road and, and feeling miserable about how wretched he is because he can't, he, he, he didn't deserve to even be able to go home, yet he's walking down the road headed home. Luke 15, again in 21, says, His son said, Father, I've sinned against you. Well, he knew that. When you say, God, I've sinned against you, he knew that. And I'm no longer worthy of being your son. He knew that. God knows that about you. As the father comes to meet him, he, the kid, sees his worth. Do you understand? As he's coming down the road and sees his father running down the road toward him, all of a sudden he ha realizes he's not just a servant. He's not just a stupid kid that rebelled against his father and blew everything on, on horrible living. All he saw was the love in his father's eyes as his father comes to him. And he says, uh, you know, Luke 6, 36 reminds us, it tells us to be merciful even as our father is merciful. The, the father in this story is being merciful and all he wants you to do is repent and turn away from the pig pen that you're in. Turn to Jesus and you'll see the Father coming to meet you with wide open arms. It doesn't matter what you've done. Can I just ask you to think about something? People all the time are, are, are thinking, yeah, but you don't know, preacher, what, what, what horrible things I've done and, and how bad I am. Let me ask you something. Is your sin greater than God? Is your capable, are you capable of doing something far beyond what God can forgive? Then your God is not who my God is. Because your God can't forgive. My God forgives. Did he deserve it? No. Did he want to know the whole story? No. He didn't want to hear about what he did. God lets us, lets us confess. You know what confession is? It's the, um, the ability to agree with God. In other words, his confession to his father probably sounded something like, I know, Father, I shouldn't have done that. That was a dumb thing for me to do. I've ruined my life. But I, 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 just, I, I just want to be a servant of yours. And he said, no, no, you can't just be a servant of mine. You were mine. God says to you, you are mine. We have to see God as holy and righteous and just. In other words, he is so holy that he can't stand sin anywhere in his presence. But he is also righteous in the sense that whatever he does has to be perfectly right. He's God. What's right? Right is that sin, the soul that sinneth, it has to die. Hell is involved in that death. There has to be a punishment for sin. There has to be. You deserved the punishment for sin. He's a just God. If he were to let you off, if he were to just turn you loose and let you off, he would not be just. 
he would break his own character and he no longer would be God. But he exhibits all of these characteristics in mercy. In other words, he said, there's another way. I won't punish you. I'll punish Jesus. And God, the Son, the middle portion of the Godhead stood up and said, I'll go and I'll take his beating. I'll go and I'll let them cram the crown of thorns into my brow so that they won't his. I'll go and I'll be the one who is tortured and whose beard is jerked out by the roots and whose hair is pulled and, and jerked around and slapped and mocked. I'll let them take my clothes off and put me on the cross naked so that they won't do it to put your name in there. See, because the Father chooses to forgive in this story. The Father doesn't even listen. The, word, the, the definition of, of forgiveness is, is release from bondage and imprisonment. It's letting us go as if our sins have never been committed. You see, because God can't overlook your sin, but because He gave it on to Jesus and Jesus was paid the debt for you, died for you. He's not turning you loose without it being paid for. It's been paid for. It's, what he does is he, he, he takes the sin and puts it on Jesus' back. Jesus pays for it. And then he turns to you and says, what sin are you talking about? There's no sin. You haven't sinned. You haven't rejected me. So in a sense, in our, pic in our picture of our prodigal son story, the father looks at the son and says, what are you talking about? You've been gone on a trip, but you're home. Forgiveness is taking someone who does not deserve it in your eyes and setting them free and then finding out that you were the one in the prison. Because you see, forgiveness, when we for, refuse to forgive, we put ourselves in a cage. Can I beg you? Forgive those that you think have slighted you or done wrong to you, even if you never get to see the answer that you wanted to see. It's not up to you. It's God that's involved here. And he says, forgive, just like the story that I read you. Where, where he forgave him everything and the guy went and found somebody that owed him something and wouldn't give him forgiveness. And God says, wait, watch out. I'll throw you into prison again so that you can go back and pay it again. You don't want that. I don't want that. Nobody wants that. So when we get in here and get to looking and I got to quit, I got to hurry. Notice three things. He puts a ring on his finger. That's a symbol of actually of giving him the authority of the checkbook. That ring was a signet ring. He put the ring on his finger and it says, you're not the servant because you get to write the checks. He puts a, a robe on his back and that robe is a picture of, of taking off the old filthy, nasty garments that he had on and probably still smelt like pig and put a brand new fresh one. Maybe, 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 just maybe, my, my, my just thinking, uh, thinking out of the box, maybe this was the same robe he took off and threw at his father's feet and said, I'm no longer your son. And all the father did was went and laundered it and gave it back to him when he come home. Maybe the ring was already on his finger and he threw it in the dirt and said, I don't, do, I don't want to be your son no more. The father evidently kept his inheritance intact while he was gone. And God keeps your inheritance intact from the time of Adam to be back in the presence of Almighty God. Can you get that, what that means? 
The power that is held in that statement is beyond my ability to say it. The holy God of this universe wants you back at his right hand. He rejoices. They make party. <laughs> Luke 15, 10. Luke 15 says in the same way, there's, there's present, there's joy in the presence of the angels when even one sinner repents. The angels break out in, in, a, in a party when you came to Christ. You think you felt good. You think you felt good when knowing that God had forgiven you of your sins. The angels went nuts in heaven. Man, if you can't see that, you're just not looking at it through my, the way my eyes see things. There's a party going on. Every time somebody accepts Christ, there's a party going on. You lead somebody to the Lord, there's a party going on. You know why? Because the party, and I put it down this way, let the party begin. Because in Revelation 19, 5 through 9, the story there is told, and from the throne, there's a voice crying out. Look, you, you get this picture? Millions upon millions of people around the throne of God, and all of them are rejoicing and singing and praising God. And, and here's what they're saying. Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage supper of the, Lamb, of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted for her to clothe herself in fine linen. See the robe? And bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Actually, I'm going to change that again to back to the original thought in that, and that is the righteousness of the saints. What is the righteousness of the saints? It's not our deeds. We haven't done anything but filthy rags. We haven't done anything but mess things up. But Jesus did it for us, and we get to claim it. And these are the things that are going on in heaven at the end of the age. So why not realize that God has got a, a celebration going on, just like the Father put on a celebration for His Son, J.C. Riley put it this way. He said, how do we respond to this, basically? How do we respond to being forgiven by the Father, God Almighty? Number one, he says, forgiven souls hate sin. We do. We hate our sin. That's the reason we're quick to confess it. Number two, forgiven souls love Christ. Well, that's a given. Number three, Forgiven souls are humble. Number four, forgiven souls are holy. But look at this one. Number five, forgiven souls are forgivers. You see, because when we come back from the, to the Father, come back next week. You'll get to touch on this one a little more. When we come back and the party breaks out because you're home, there's somebody sending back that needs to hear the rest of the story. The elder son, he was mad because the younger son was forgiven. And so he held him to a higher account and said he, he didn't deserve it, so therefore he wasn't going to. Listen, who was the elder son anyway? I mean, the story's not about him anyway. <laughs> But yet we see this, the joy is in forgiving. The joy in your Christian life is in forgiving. You know, somebody hurts you, pray for them. Pray about them, I don't, I don't care, pray, you know. Do whatever needs to happen, but then let it go and let God have it and you forgive them. That, what does that mean? It means you turn them loose out of your cage that you fashioned for them because it's, it's not up to you to be the judge anyway. 
You turn them loose and then you let God show you how much he loves them and you don't get selfish and get, and get your poochy lip because God loves them even though they hurt your feelings. We're going to come back to this thought next week, but I just want you to see God loves all of us, but he expects us to forgive each other just like we have been forgiven. And man, some of you are carrying around things that you've got to forgive. They're going to eat you alive. See, most people hold unforgiveness towards somebody. They don't even, the other person doesn't even know how much it's hurting you. You say, well, they ought to know. Well, tell God, don't tell me. I can't do anything about it. But the thing is, God loves you. And God is so excited to forgive you, just like that father is, for, is so excited to put his son right back where he needed to be. You're that son. Let's all stand. Have you been forgiven? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? As, as you realize that you need forgiveness, then you talk to God about it, even right now while we're getting ready to close. But if you have been forgiven, then catch the rest of that story. Forgiven people are forgivers. They forgive others and drop it and go on. Heavenly Father, today we're going to close our little service here, but it's never closed as long as you are in control. You keep working on our hearts, teaching us, telling us of how your word applies to you as well as us. Father, I pray that you would help us. Forgive us of our sins and help us to forgive those who need to be forgiven by us. Let us rejoice with the angels in heaven when someone comes to know Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I am found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught My heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How did that grace appear the hour I first believed through me while you guys are singing I just want to say if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior right now just bow your head and just say God here I am a sinner I need your forgiveness and open your heart in faith to trust Him. And grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secure. one we're gonna sing when we've been there. listen careful ten trillion years it don't matter how many right shining as the sun 
We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we stand here before you and get ready to go home. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to have you in our presence. You've told us that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're right here with us. And Lord, I, I thank you for that. But Father, there may be somebody here today that a portion of the sermon of some kind, it may have touched their hearts. I pray that right now that they would bow their head to you and the knees in their, in their, in their heart, if not in physical, would, would get on their knees and say, God, I needed that and I need to forgive and I need to be forgiven. We give it over to you, Father, because the Holy Spirit can tell me and the Holy Spirit can knock on my heart, but I need to respond. And I ask, Lord, that right now, anywhere anybody's hearing my voice, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We give it over to you. And I pray blessings upon everyone here. I pray that they would feel the presence of God and I speak Jesus over them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go home happy and blessed. Amen. God bless you, sir. Thank you.